ETF taxation versus mutual fund taxation, part two, investment for beginners, investing for beginners. Again, critical, critical, critical stuff here, my friends. Taxes are the biggest enemy you have other than debt. I'm just telling you right now. Well, you got three big ones. You got investment management fees. You know how I feel about that. You got taxes and you got debt. Those three things, get rid of all three and you're going to be in a good place. That's for sure. And ETFs, exchange traded funds, will help you eliminate taxes. And they probably will help you eliminate investment management fees too, unless you hire an investment advisor to manage your ETFs. And then you're just, you're not paying the ETF. Uh, manager, you're actually paying your investment advisor instead. So that's not what I'm talking about here. But we're going to dive into the taxes on this episode. Critical for you to understand it. So welcome. Here it is, Wealth Planning YouTube channel, the place you come to learn about tax planning, investment planning, financial planning, retirement planning, 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 planning. So stay tuned. We got, man, we got this. Is, this article right here gets me fired up like nothing else. I love this stuff. So let's dive right into it. Don't forget to subscribe, by the way. Subscribe. You see my little subscribe, subscribe, brainwashing, subscribe. All right, so this right here is Rob Arnott, or I th there used to be a hockey player for the New Jersey Devils, and I think he went to Dallas Stars named Jason Arnott. I thought it was Arnott, but I think they called him Arnott. So I'm not sure if Rob's name is Arnott or Arnott. I think it's Arnott, but he's with a firm called Research Affiliates, and one of the, I just tell you, um, this guy, in my opinion, should get a Nobel Prize. The research Rob has done, I've never met the guy, it's just been fundamentally, it's just absolutely Nobel Prize winning, without question. I don't even know if he's a full-fledged economist. I think he is. Frankly, don't care. When it comes to Nobel Prize in economics, this guy qualifies because his stuff has done has been revolutionary. Is your, In fact, if you go to Research Affiliates website, which we're on right here, I, <laughs> if you read, I'd say – say 10 articles, you'll know more about investments than the vast majority of professionals out there, CFP or otherwise. It's the you know, stuff that Research Affiliates does is just is mind boggling. And it's just how it's just as fantastic as free. Um, all right. So is your tax, is your alpha big enough to cover its taxes? A quarter century retrospective. He just wrote this two months ago. Alpha, just remember what alpha means, is to basically have the, the, the market returns you one and you get one and a half. So your alpha in that case is 50. Does that make sense? Or we call 50 basis points. So you get 1%, uh, your, your, your market gave you one, but your fund gave you one and a half percent. You got 50 basis points or one half of 1% above the market, which means your alpha, your outperformance is, is uh, 50 basis points. Now, if that were you, you still got to pay tax on this. Will it be covered enough to cut? Co well, your 50 basis points that you made above the market return be enough to cover the taxes you owe? Let's talk about this. There's my man Rob right there. Uh, key points deferring taxes is like receiving a free loan from the government. The tax burden can be reduced by eliminating term, limiting turnover, reducing dividend yield, and investing in smaller, more tax aware funds. So I just want to point this out because I talk a lot about asset location, asset location. And one of the things I get a question all the time is, and one of my pet peeves is people who have bonds and Roth IRAs. Just don't do that. I just want to jump through a, a window head first uh, on a, a, when you have bonds and a Roth IRA. But either way, so people say, what should I have instead? So you have your three buckets of money. And I'm just going to draw. Let me just bring myself a little, up a little bit here. And you got your tax, your tax deferred, and your tax, oops, and you're free. All right, so you got our three buckets of money here. Tax. That's your non-qualified taxable account. Your tax deferred, that's your IRA, 401k, and your tax free is going to be your Roth. Now, some would say life insurance. I'm, I'm just talking investments here, but that's your Roth IRA. So you got the three buckets. In those buckets, in your taxable account, we want anything that's low dividend, preferably no dividend, and low cap gains. All right. And then your tax deferred, we want bonds, and your Roth, your Roth, we want uh, large cap and international stocks that have dividends. All right, so you're gonna read my wonderful handwriting there. So here's your tax-free account right there. We want large cap that typically pay dividends and international stocks that generally pay dividends as well. We want that there or any funds with a high turnover. High turnover just means they generate a lot of capital gains that has to be distributed to you as the ultimate shareholder. Because it's distributed in a Roth IRA, you don't pay tax. Uh, your bonds and your tax deferred, the only place you'd want to put bonds would be your tax deferred account without question. 
unless it's a high yield. We talked about this before, and I don't want to get into that here, but just that would be the one exception, and I'd ask why you even have the high yield to begin with. All right, then finally, in our taxable account, we want our, uh, our low turnover and low dividends, and preferably no dividends. And low turnover would give low capital gain distributions and low dividends. Now, things are going to change when you read this, when you, I read this article for you, because low capital gains are inherent in, a, in an ETF. So let's, let me minimize myself again and get right back and rob stuff. Uh, exchange traded fund pr funds provide tax efficiencies that mutual funds lack. This is why you pay me the big bucks, my friends, to report to you the ways you can generate profits without going through the roof of the risk. Just the idea of ETFs, exchange traded funds, provide tax efficiencies, mutual funds can't. You just got to understand this. All right. Costs matter to every bottom line. Investment management is no exception. Costs, both implicit, such as trading related market impact costs, and costs and explicit such as management fee management fees and and trading costs lower bottom line returns and one of the largest costs for any taxable investor is taxes in the seventh article of our advisory series we discuss how to identify tax efficient managers and describe the investment vehicle structures which is what we're going to talk about here today that deliver after tax alpha uh, we're going to draw on the journal portfolio management article, the same title, again, written by Rob and a couple of his partners there. 25 years ago in the article, is your alpha big enough to cover his taxes? Uh, Tad, Jeffrey, and I, Rob, published our findings on the impact taxes have on investment returns. We call this ever-present burden tax alpha, which is reliably, reliably negative. The good news, however, is that now, as then, the tax burden arising from realized capital gains and dividend income is surprisingly easy to shrink. Diligence and deferring capital gains, loss harvesting, lot selection when selling, wash sale management, holding periods, other tax or strategies can substantially lower the government's cut of investor returns. Okay. Since 1993, a growing awareness by managers of the importance of tax efficiency, new investment strategies such as smart beta, innovative investing structures, such as exchange traded funds, there it is again, have all improved investors' ability to reduce the tax bite into investors' returns. But other things haven't changed. Active managers still have a hard time consistently generating pre-tax alpha, and the fees of active managers are still high. Therefore, for investors to earn the best possible after-tax return, they and their advisors must consider all additions to and, abstract and subtractions from the following equation. Gross of return, so let's say 10%, 2% fees, 2% income tax, the dividends of capital gains, 2% capital gains tax after liquidation equals 4% uh, rate of return. So that's your that's that's the, <laughs> the equation. Gross of return fees or if gross of fees return, you subtract out your fees, subtract out your taxes on distributions, subtract out your tax on liquidations, and that's your active absence after tax return. Consequently, an advisor's ultimate goal should be to shrink the tax alpha drag on their investor portfolio without forfeiting pre-tax alpha. Our findings over a quarter century ago, so there's my man Jack Bogle in 1997, point out that unrealized capital gains are akin to a free loan from the IRS. Deferring the tax liability on a capital gain allows it to grow undiminished to the investment horizon. All being equal, the larger the deferral, the larger the after-tax benefit to the taxable investor. One way to maximize the deferral is to limit portfolio turnover. And again, I've talked about this a million times on Sunday. You look at Morningstar, I think even Yahoo, MarketWatch, they all say portfolio turnover. 100% turnover means that fund trades the whole entire of its holdings once a year. That's what it means. It has 100 stocks today. They'll have 100 stocks at, at the following year, but they'll trade each of those stocks at least one time. Now, it doesn't have to trade every stock. It just means if it trades GE, it could trade GE five times, which actually means it doesn't have to trade Apple. Does that make sense? But 100 transactions will have been made to get that 100% turnover on a, on a fund that has 100 stocks. So it, easier to look at. You have 100 stocks today. You have 100 different stocks a year from now. But it's, it's not quite that simple, but I hope you get the point. It has to make 100 transactions. 100 stocks today, 100 transactions. All right. Uh, turnover is a powerful predictor of a strategy's tax efficiency because most turnover creates a taxable gain when a security is sold. Investors pay taxes on those realized gain, losing opportunity to earn a profit on the taxes they paid and did not defer. 
Understanding that a positive relationships exist between the size of a portfolio's unrealized gain and its pre-tax terminal market value, we analyze how turnover affects the after-tax market value of a portfolio. One of our most profound findings was that the marginal impact of taxes is most severe at very low rates of annual turnover. When we assume a starting position of 100%, $100, 6% annual portfolio appreciation, 20-year investment horizon, and a 35% cap gain rate, similar to our short-term capital gain tax rates, often triggered by high turnovers, we see that the terminal after-tax wealth falls $58 from $320 to $262 as annual turnover moves from 0 to 10%. And 10% is quite low, my friends. That loss is larger than the nearly $48 decrease in terminal after-tax when the turnover increases from 10 to 100%. So what he's saying here is at the end of the day, having zero turnover is substantially greater from an after-tax return-wise than having 10% turnover, which is still quite low. But having 100% turnover is actually not nearly as dastardly from going from 10 to 100 as it is from 0 to 10. It's amazing. And so it shows here, if, if, if you're listening on the podcast, we've got a beginning market value in year one of 100 bucks. We have a 10% uh Let's see, what, 10% annual turnover. So after the first year, we have $105.80. After the 20th year, we have $251.20 of value. So again, 10% annual turnover. Start year one with 100 bucks. After 20 years, we have 251. Again, we're assuming a 6% rate of return. Uh, what happened? Oh, okay, cool. I, right, I got to go back. All right, so uh, let's see. Capital gains tax. We're, you see the tax. We're paying some taxes there. You know, Not a huge amount, uh, but a pretty significant amount after we realize the capital gains. We have a cost basis of 170 and we have an ending market value of 262. So all this is saying is that we start the year 20 with $251. Before taxes at the end of the year 20, we have $266. Our cost basis, because we paid to, we had all these distributions over those previous 19 years is 164. We started with 100 bucks as a cost basis, now it's 164. So over those 20 year times, we had to pay taxes on $64 of income. Uh, we realized gain of $10 because we sold the stock after the year of 20, which means the 35% capital gains tax is $3.60. After tax proceeds is $6.60, meaning our ending cost basis is $170. Ending market value is $262. I know that's a lot to chomp on. I get that. But what we're saying is if we if we started with $100, our ending market value is $262. All right, after a 10% annual turnover. With a 0% annual turnover, i.e. no capital gains, our ending market value is $320. We started with 100, get 6% rate of return for 20 years, we got $320 left. Start with 100, get 6% rate of return, but only have a 10% turnover, we have $262. That's a significant, significant decline in value. Now, if we have 100% turnover after 20 years, it's still pretty bad, it's ugly. We start with 100 bucks, after tax, we have 214, or we'll just say 215. I mean, that's the thing. That's where the turnover eats you alive. If you have 100% turnover year over year over year, you've you've only doubled your money after 20 years. If you have no turnover, you've more than tripled your money after 20 years. That's the cost of taxes right there in a nutshell, my friends. All right, so let me close out of this. Keep going. This I love this stuff. Hope you do too. All right, what our research found, what we talked about. So what's new since 1993? Tax advantage investing is now well-established part of the asset management business, although not nearly as large as it should be. Many techniques allow us to defer taxes with relatively little detriment to a fund's pre-tax performance, but sadly, they command only a small niche in the enormous industry. Some of these strategies are deferring of capital gains, loss harvest. We already talked about all this stuff, so I'm not going to talk about it again. Today, tax-aware investing, as compared to the more aggressive forms of tax advantage investing, composes a march, much larger segment of the asset management arena. Uh, over the last, okay, let's see. As a result, these managers may capture some of the benefit of tax advantage investing, uh, but prioritize the quest for an uncertain and all too often negative pre-tax alpha ahead of the quest for a predictable and manageable reduction that drag associated with reliably negative tax alpha. All right. Over the last 25 years, three other notable and positive changes that impact tax and portfolios have taken place. First, advisors, consultants, and investors are all much more aware of the importance of seeking to maximize after-tax returns. And I, again, Arnott or Arnott, uh, Morningstar, Jack Bogle, all these guys, one of the reasons they should win the Nobel. 
Secondly, the introduction of exchange traded funds. Huh, back to old ETFs, huh? And exchange traded notes now offer investors a powerful tool for tax efficiency. These structures are designed to allow the deferral capital gain taxes typically at lower long-term rates until the investment vehicle is actually sold, like holding an individual stock. Third, uh, he talks about smart beta. We're not getting into that. All right, so what hasn't changed since 1993? Analysis of the data over the last 25 years highlight the fact that two things haven't changed since 1993. Persistent alpha is still fleeting and active managers' fees are still high. The evidence shows that the capitalization weighted index is still hard to beat for most active managers. According to the data from the S&P, indices versus active over the 10-year horizon ending December 31st, 2017, 82.4% of large cap funds underperformed the S&P 500 index. <sighs> Manager fees, easily tracked and understood by investors, are still high at slightly over 1% a year as the average expense, expense ratio for actively managed mutual funds. Um, Higher fund expenses, including, of course, manager fees, are associated with worse performance. In 2003, my man Jack Bogle wrote about the cost matters hypothesis, as he called it. <laughs> he said, whether markets are efficient or inefficient, investors as a group must fall short of the market return by the amount of the cost they incur. It's just it's, that's simple. That's it. I, Bogle it keeps it makes it so easy to understand. Doesn't matter inefficient or, in, or uh, efficient markets. The the, uh, the market as a whole will get X. You have fees for that X. I say one percent. That means uh, investors on the whole will get X minus one. It's just there's no getting around that because the fees come out net of the market return. <sighs> Passive index funds are launched. It are launched in large part to lower manager fees and in practice actually improve after fee performance. And uh, Bogle finds that passive managers, even after fees, performed as well as the top quintile, quintile of active managers. Yep. All right. So that's good. And here we show he just kind of goes over the expense ratios of active managed funds. Haven't changed much. About 1.1. 1 .1, it was at 1.1, 1 .1, I guess. And now we're sitting at about 1.05. So it dropped about five basis points. What to do? Uh, expense ratios on passive funds right here. So about you know, roughly 0 0.5 to right about 0.4. And that's, a, that's 25% decline. All right, so what I like by distribution of fund expenses by Morningstar categories, expense ratios, as you can see here, this is for active funds, the median's at 1%. So that means there's a bunch of funds that charge even more than one. Uh, passive funds, the median's 0.27, and that means there's a lot of funds that charge even less than that. It's just, it's you got to follow that. So the goal is to find tax-efficient managers, all right? And so what Arna talks about, is uh, so how can investors advisors apply our findings to allocate to the most tax efficient fund managers and strategies, which have the ability to deliver the highest after tax returns to their investors? To answer this question, we looked at more than 4,000 US benchmark funds and ETS with at least two years of live history. Uh, categories in a sample into four groups, active, active, uh, active, active, passive, factor, and smart beta based on keywords that fit their uh, description. Um, and what I just love this. All right. So gross of fees, all funds, gross of fees, average 0.7 or active funds had a uh, net of uh, a positive return. Gross of fees, 0.7%. Net of fees had a negative return. Pre-tax liquidation. Again, that means just holding, you're getting your fund, you're getting your fund, you're getting your fund distribution each and every year, but you're not selling your fund each and every year to get the fund distribution. You, you lost 1.5%. After tax liquidation, when you actually sold that puppy, you lost 1.9. So essentially, your active fund lost almost 2% because of fees and taxes. It's crazy. Now, if you look, at, and now we talk about, uh, now you can see again, it's a fundamental index, which is a, a research affiliate a group of uh, investment advisor. And I actually I like it. But when you factor in after taxes, after fees, they're still positive. And that's simply because they eliminate taxes and have lower fees. It's just, it's just, I can't express this more. Lower taxes, lower fees, and you're, the likelihood of you outperforming is almost inevitable. It's just, it's, it's just that simple. Lower taxes, lower fees. Yeah. For a taxable investor, the ETF may be the most important innovation in a investment structure that has emerged over the last quarter century. 
Compared to a mutual fund, an ETF has lower fees and is able to defer capital gains and the tax liability associated with those gains much more efficiently. Over the entire 25-year period we studied, 53% of ETFs made no capital gain distributions whatsoever, while only 4.9% of mutual funds could boast such strong tax-efficient behavior. The low rate of capital gain distributions meant that none of the ETFs generated a tax burden higher than 1% in capital gains tax alpha compared to the 40% of mutual funds that did so. An ETF's tax efficiency remains after considering the taxation of dividend income. Nearly half of the mutual funds we studied had distributions that generated burden in excess of 1%, leading to 0.8% percent worse tax alpha for mutual funds than for ETS. I just, you can't, you just, that's essentially what you're saying is because of the tax efficiency of an ETF, you generate almost a full percentage point more in net of return in ETFs and over mutual funds. Conclusion, management fees, the investment industry's most visible cost, often get more attention than the less visible and typically larger costs, 100% agree, associated with trading and taxes. Investors and their advisors must be alert to managing both pre-tax and after-tax alpha in order for investors to realize the highest possible return from their taxable portfolios. Increasingly, the opportunities to accomplish both goals are within reach as investors of more managers are becoming tax aware and innovative strategies such as smart beta and investing vehicles such as ETS, exchange traded funds, have entered the market over the last quarter century. All right, so I, man, I tell you, Arnett, or not, just I'll put a link to this in the show notes. At the end of the day, if you have a taxable account, there's absolutely no reason to have a mutual fund. It's you're just leaving money on the table from a tax perspective. It's just there's no way. There's no way to have a, a taxable account in or a mutual fund in a taxable account. You are leaving money on the table and most likely paying much, much higher investment management fees as well. All right. So I hope you like this. Go read the research or anything research affiliates does. Anything that they write should be worth your time to read for sure. Uh, it's not that difficult to comprehend. It might take it two or three times to read and that's fine. It does me and I'm a professional. So look at uh, Jason, uh, his or Jason, that's a hockey player, Rob. <laughs> I'm one of their brothers, but look at Rob Arnott stuff and then a research affiliates. I cannot uh, emphasize how much I, I, I just a huge fan of research affiliates. So if you like what you see here, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Comments always welcome. Thumbs up, thumbs up. And then go to heritagewealthplanning.com. We're going to see a new website here coming out in the next day or two. So stay tuned. New website coming to the forefront with my man, Dave from Pennsylvania. He's doing it for me for fee. Hey, man, pay pay for value added. That's for sure. So hope you like this. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. 